Okay, so today I want to walk through the model that we've started with aggregate demand and aggregate supply. It's a little different than what your uh, <coughs> textbook for money and banking has, but I'm gonna, going to point out where they're similar and different. Some of it's just the, the titles, but um, the one I'm doing gives a combination of chapter 22 and chapter 23. So kind of the Keynesian, we can think about the Keynesian line of thinking and the classical line of thinking all in one spot. And then I'll, I'll highlight where, where those differences come about. So home base, we're going to start off in what we call a long run equilibrium. And we've got aggregate demand, which we've defined before, short run aggregate supply, and then draw a long run aggregate supply straight through the middle of all three. <clears throat> One of the key features of these models is that we're always somewhere. We always start someplace. There's always some status quo. And so right now I'm going to say that our current status quo is right here at what we call a long run equilibrium because we're currently operating at the potential level of real GDP. So that is the anchoring spot wherever you see this vertical aggregate supply curve showing the long run potential for the economy. Where do we expect things to be if resources are fully employed? All right, and we have some price level. Maybe it's 100, which is equivalent to our base year prices, but I'm just giving an arbitrary starting spot. So some price level of 100 and resource prices here. Okay, um, so let's shock the system. <laughs> Suppose we have an increase in government spending. Suppose there is an increase in G. The government is going to go out and purchase some weapons of mass destruction. All right, does anybody remember what happened? I think we did this one. We even gave you a short little quiz. So you can flip back in your notes. Change in G, change in government spending. Supply goes up. Supply goes up. Which supply? Was it long run or short run? Short. Short run? Does everybody agree with that? Government spends more money. What's that? An increase in aggregate demand. Okay, that's it. Everybody find it in their notes? Make sure you know where that's at in your notes. An increase in aggregate demand. So it was one of our aggregate demand shifters. So we have a bunch of players, so to speak, in aggregate demand. Aggregate means what? The total or the summing up of everybody's behavior, right? Who are the agents that are in this aggregate demand action. I already named one, government. Who Consumers, else? Consumers. Consumers and businesses, right, households. So if we go back to our, our island, we've got households. <laughs> we've got Potentially all the players identified, households, businesses, and the government. Those are, that's it. We're, we're pigeonholing everybody into that. I have left out the rest of the world on this, but not totally, just on this picture I did. It's still in there because of net exports. What we sell, our businesses are selling stuff to the Chinese, our people are buying stuff from the Chinese. So even the rest of the world is captured in on, on this. So when we're looking at 
U.S. domestic policy, which is what this graph is reflecting, it comes to us from those three agents. And again, our current status quo is there's a certain level of consumption, a certain level of investment, a certain level of government spending, and a certain level of exports. So if you want to put a little cigarettes there, and maybe put a little zero subscript, consumption's at some level, investment's at some level, government spending's at some level, and net exports is at some level. Now I shock the system. So we're saying maybe government spending was 100 million on weapons, and now G1 is 150 million on weapons. So government spending went up. We've changed one of these things, so at each level of the price level, holding other things constant, that's going to relocate the aggregate demand curve to the right. So aggregate demand shifts. And this aggregate demand curve has the old level of consumption, the old level of investment, the new level of government spending, and the old level of exports, net exports. So the only thing we've changed is that the government's now buying more weapons. <clears throat> okay, so now we see some action happening, right? All of a sudden we've got more intersection points that unveil themselves after we do the shift. So, Government spending increasing, expansionary or contractionary, fiscal or monetary policy. What is it? Expansion, fiscal. Expansionary fiscal. fiscal policy. Right? Expansionary fiscal policy. So why do we use the word expansion? We're thinking GDP is going to expand. What was our three policy goals? Inflation being low and stable, policy goal, low stable inflation, what else? What about GDP, what do we want it doing? Increasing, Increasing GDP, and the last one? Jobs or unemployment, low unemployment. All right, so that expansionary fiscal policy leads to an expansion of the economy to Y1. So real GDP has gone up to this level. Now, how did we <laughs> increase beyond our potential? That's kind of a weird one. Right? Is it possible, what's the catch here? It's almost like I don't get it. Here's where our potential GDP, when we did the production possibilities frontier, and I said point A, could I be at point B? No, this was the maximum potential of two goods an economy could produce given its available resources and technology. Well now I'm, and I said that this was kind of like this. So that's a little bit different here. How is that happening? Here's full employment of resources. New technology would start to shift this one. But good, we're going we're gonna to get there. So if there's a new technology, then we could shift out. What's the unemployment rate at this level? Is it zero? No, what is it? Five to six percent, we said that natural rate. So we kind of, we know that there's some unemployment rate that's healthy for a growing, vibrant economy. People quit their jobs voluntarily. We talked about that last time. So when we move to a point like this, is it possible for people who are working 40 hours a week to now work 45? Yes, right? So that's the idea here, is that it's possible for us to push beyond potential, but in the long run, is that feasible? No, that's what we're saying, is that we can get there, but we expect to come back to here. But for a while there, we can push ourselves beyond our potential. So that's one argument why we might have a little leeway to get 
beyond our potential. Okay, so um, prices are on their way up. So prices, I'm just going to make up a number, jump up to 103. So what is inflation due to this increase? 3%. Good. So remember, that's the connection between the price level and the inflation rate. It's the rate of change of the price level. So 103 minus 100 divided by 100 gives us a 3% change in the price level, or 3% inflation. All right, now, dig back to your notes about the short run aggregate supply curve. In order for us to move from a point like A, let's call it, to a point like B, this had an assumption behind it. Probably the, the, the absolute key assumption distinguishing Keynesian and classical thought for that matter. One of the distinguishing characteristics. What's true along the short run aggregate supply curve? For example, along this aggregate demand curve, consumption, investment, government spending, and net exports were all held constant. There's something being held constant here along that curve. What was it? Anybody see it? Look back on the definition of short run aggregate supply. I think I gave it to you. I might not have. <laughs> price of what? Price of resources are constant. Find that in your notes. If you don't have it, write it down. Where did you find that, Chelsea? What did we do before? We had a little squiggly. November 2nd, you got your notes dated? Okay, November 2nd. You guys should be dating your notes if you're not, by the way. It's a good idea, good habit to get into when we start a class to date your notes. So November 2nd, short run aggregate supply, along a given short run aggregate supply curve, we're going to hold resource prices constant, allowing output prices to increase. That's when we talked about the lag time potentially between the prices on the goods at the shelves at Walmart and the wages that they pay their employees. Those two things don't necessarily move. In fact, we'd expect the output prices to move more quickly than the resource prices. That's the distinction we're making, is that in the resource market, the price of the rental rate for capital, for instance, so if you rent a building on Main Street, you've probably locked in a, a one-year lease or a five-year lease, right? Your rent payments for the building don't change very quickly. The economy might go up and down and you might have to run some sales and change the prices of your paint that's on the shelves at the paint store in Ottawa, but your rent doesn't change very quickly, right? So we have this stickiness to prices that ends up playing an important role in the resource market, whether it's wages tending to be sticky or rents tending to be sticky or contracts on interest payments. If we go and get a loan, we might have a five-year fixed interest rate on the loan that I have for my grill at my restaurant, right? You start thinking about it, and there tends to be some rigidity in resource prices potentially out there in the economy. So that's what this curve shows, is a rigidity in the resource prices. So the idea here is that I'm going to use a big W for nominal wages, but really it reflects, I could put a big W and a big R for rent payment and a big I for interest payments, whatever. We can think about resource prices being fixed. I'm just going to keep it with a W here of 10. So imagine that we're paying our employees $10 an hour on average is their nominal wage. So how do we move from A to B? The prices of my products are going up by 3%, but I'm paying my workers the same. Resource prices are constant. Output prices are going up. That's what's going on in the economic model here. Right? Along this curve, we move from A to B by that notion. 
Let's play that out a little bit further. So when my workers go home to their kids and they run out to Walmart, they start to see that the prices of the goods they buy that they put in their shopping cart are going up by 3%. But their wage hasn't. And they don't notice it at first, but month after month after month goes by and they're starting to think, wow, I just my shopping cart's not getting quite as full on my $10 wage. What should I do? Ask for a raise. And it's a legitimate claim to say, hey, I can see you're doing pretty good, business owner. You've been enjoying some price increases. The economy's doing pretty well. There's an expansion going on. The economy's heating up. Everybody's enjoying. Share a little bit of the love. Right? Give me a raise. I deserve one. At a very minimum, I need to keep up with inflation. I'd love to get at least a 3% raise to keep up with inflation. That's just keeping me at the same point I was last year. Really, I'm a good worker and you need to give me even more than a 3%, like a 5 or 10% pay, but at least a 3%. Okay, so that's the idea, is that resource prices will eventually begin to increase. What happens to this short-run aggregate supply curve? It shifts to the left. So now, as resource prices begin to adjust to the climate we're in, the short-run aggregate supply curve is going to shift to the left as people start to get those pay raises. Increasing resource prices cause real GDP to fall, right? So all of a sudden now we've got real GDP starting to fall, prices starting to go up. How does that fit into our policy goals? Are we heading in the right direction? <clears throat> so we got increasing prices and decreasing real GDP. And what's happening to unemployment, our last one, as GDP starts to fall, unemployment Increase. goes up or down? Uh, so all three bad things, the things that we were seeking, are starting to change on us as we start to have this adjustment in the negative direction. So I'm going to interject this. I don't want to do it too quickly. But what would policymakers tend to do when that starts happening? Spend more money, right? Spend more money. Oh, while well, the economy is drifting back, we need to do a new program. Spend more money to help the economy out. All right, I'll come back to that later. But that I just wanted to interject that that's a possibility as we start to see something bad happen. That is dependent upon this uh, gap that we have. Remember, we had the word gap with the Taylor, uh, the Taylor formula. So here we have an inflationary gap. An inflationary gap. By definition, all we're saying is that the actual level of real GDP is greater than the long run potential level. We have an inflationary gap. Okay, so what is equilibrium? I mean, where do we get to when finally maybe there's this grand equalization, equilibrium, a situation where there's no tendency for change? This is my nice generic definition I like to use for equilibrium. A situation in which there's no tendency for change. Where does that happen in this picture? I, the only thing I've changed, and I kind of want to just map out the logic, the only thing I've done so far, and the only thing I'm going to do right now, is to analyze the long-run impacts of a one-time increase in government spending from 100 to 150. Where is the long-run equilibrium? <laughs> Higher, good, where? 
Point B. There's a specific point you can tell me where we're at. Point B is where we're going to be at the long run? No. Where are we going to be? You can just explain there is no additional points, but I'm going to draw a new point. <coughs> Where's my new point C going to be? The intersection of the aggregate demand curve and the long term aggregate supply. Good. The long run aggregate supply and the aggregate demand curve. That's where we'd expect things to come to a rest again, is point C. <clears throat> So, back to our classical Keynesian discussion. The classical economist would say this curve doesn't even exist. In other words, we can talk in an academic sense about going from A to B and then get to C, but they would say markets are efficient, prices adjust, resource prices and output prices adjust fairly quickly and maybe there's a staggering effect of, of contracts so yes the person on Main Street is stuck in a five-year lease but there's another person on Main Street that is in the fourth year of their five-year lease and their lease is coming up right so now and when we're talking about aggregate demand we're starting to add up all the businesses is there really such thing as rigidity in resource prices? We can start to think about calling that into question. And so classical economists would say, we just moved from A to C. This one doesn't even exist. Aggregate demand shifts up, and we have higher inflation rates. So in the long run, the prediction that we'd make is that we're going to get to here at 106. In the long run, we're eventually going, holding all of the things constant. We're going to gravitate back to our long run potential. You might think back to this picture where we're thinking about our long run potential being something and markets tend to go up and down around that potential. So maybe we'll swing back and forth, but eventually coming back to the long run. Now, what does this person need to be earning to maintain their purchasing power? What is the nominal wage? 16. 16? A little too strong. Slide a decimal place another uh, 1060. 1060. Went a little too heavy there. 60%. We'd all like that's the person who's really productive. They they get that 60% pay raise. But to maintain purchasing power, if the prices on the shelves at Walmart were 6%, if I get $10.60, then I will be able to put the exact same amount of stuff in my shopping cart a year later. So that's the price increase. Now in reality, these things are happening simultaneously. We don't have this discrete, the, our economic model shows us as we go from A, we go to B, just like you guys want to be, you want to know how things work perfectly and what the rules are. Well, there's no rules here, right? There's, there's different things moving at different speeds. So instead of going from A to B to C, what really happens is that there's adjustments being played simultaneously. And so maybe it starts to go up, and this starts to go up, and eventually we make our way back up to C, right? If we think in a dynamic sense of what really happens over the course of time, uh, both those things would be going on. And so the path, the path from A to B to C might look somewhere in the middle. And that's where the debate starts to kick in. But for this economic model, I like to weave in and out here. We got to rest on the logic of the model and the math is what the math is and understand that it's an economic model. And do we gain some insights into reality? So the A to B to C is our economic model. Reality is probably something going on in between. So yes? um, a diagram like this would indicate that the, the economy as a whole is about, about to go down, right? 
Is that what you're saying? Uh, you mean because we're out here, go Rush, down? Like I mean, you're, you're, that's so is, doomsday. That's true, and then yeah, like, and so yes, down, real GDP kinda... would start to fall. Right. right. Yes. If we, if we pushed it out to here. Now, again, with my two things moving mm -hmm. at the same time, if things are moving together, we might push out, but then we're kind of coming back, so right. it wouldn't go out to that extreme. Of course, I don't even have numbers down here on the sensitivity. Did we go up by uh, three pennies? On 15 trillion dollars, or did we go up by a trillion dollars? You know, so I, we're, we're just leaving those details out. Chelsea. Like, I don't know. Just makes sense. Like, what kind of time frame would this be? Like, Good. Move from A to C? The ultimate question. Yes, that that is the Keynesian classical debate. How quickly do we move from A to B to C? Keynes said, in the long run, we're all dead. So Keynes belief was that this would be a fairly long period of time by the time we get from A to B to C, what is, a long, what is in the long run, we're all dead. I mean, that's a little bit of an extreme statement, but that's what he was saying is that it's far enough out to where we should be doing something in the meantime, that it's not, markets aren't that quick. Um, so is this, you know, two months, three months, is this three years? That is truly some of the big questions. What are, what are some of the programs that were put into place to try to fend off this recession, the cash for clunkers? What's the impact of that long term? That's a big question. I mean, it helped some people, so there might be some little filtering effects. The bigger question would be, how did that change people's expectations about the government's role in the economy? You know, did that make things, uh, are you guys thinking differently about your five to ten year window now, right? Who knows? The very difficult questions to try to address um, on where that should, uh, where we ultimately end up. Okay, any other comments or questions, sir? All right, let me run through the exact steps here so that we're hopefully got the workings of the model down. So this was really step one. Let me just kind of re steps of the model. <clears throat> Number one, we had an increase in government spending which led to an increase in aggregate demand. Number two, The economy moves to point B. Because of our assumption of resource prices being fixed, the economy moves to point B because of output prices output prices increasing, but resource prices being held constant. Parentheses by assumption. Don't forget, I'm trying to highlight for you that this is what we're talking about with the model, by assumption we have these sticky prices. That's what allows us to move to point B. Alright, number three. Resource prices start to increase to catch up to output prices. So they're going to attempt to maintain purchasing power. And 
I'm just going to go ahead and put purchasing power of the wage. But again, this is more generic than that. There's other resource prices adjusting to. Okay, so let's see, resource prices start to increase. I guess I want to tag on here. This is a, a decrease in short run aggregate supply, a shift left. Four, the economy moves to the point C. equilibrium where uh, wages purchasing power is restored. points of debate. One, how long does it take for the economy to move from A to B to C? Great question. <laughs> Keynes would say, in the long run, we're dead. So long enough for government to take more action. Classical economists would say short enough that government intervention may harm us long term. But the long term isn't that long anyway. All right, let's call it a day there. <laughs>